Last night, three Israelis were wounded by a terrorist wielding a knife at a friendly mall in Gan Yavne. The attacker was shot dead while trying to stab an officer who arrived on the scene. The Gan Yavne attack followed a stabbing in Beersheba and raised concerns of a fresh outburst of Ramadan violence. More from ILTV's Steve Leibowitz. Last night's terrorist stabbing spree began in the weight room of the gym in Friendly Mall in the southern town of Ganyavne. The attacker first stabbed a man in the weight room. He then ran through the mall, attacking other victims. The attacker exited the mall where he was confronted by police and security guards and shot dead while trying to attack one of the officers. The three victims were identified as two men aged 25 and 20 and a 17-year-old teen. The victims were found in different parts of the shopping center and were rushed to a Suta hospital near Ashdod with multiple stab wounds. According to police, the terrorist used two knives in the attack. He was identified as a 19-year-old from the town of Dura near Hebron. The suspected attacker entered Israel via a hole in the security barrier and authorities were investigating if he may have been employed illegally in the mall. Earlier yesterday, an off-duty IDF officer was stabbed and lightly wounded in a terror attack at Beersheva's central bus station before being shot and killed by another soldier. Following yesterday's attacks, authorities expressed concern that the relative calm of the Ramadan period could give way to a fresh outburst of violence. Day 178 of the war in Gaza and IDF troops have withdrawn from Al-Shifa Hospital after completing a two-week anti-terror operation in the Gaza City Medical Center. Back to ILTV's Steve Leibowitz. IDF troops withdrew from Shifa Medical Center under cover of airstrikes and artillery fire. There was no immediate comment from the Army. The two-week operation was launched on March 18th in what the IDF described as a precise raid to target terrorist leaders and infrastructure. During the operation, the army captured 500 members of terror groups. During the military operation, patients and medical staff were evacuated by the IDF to a designated compound in another part of the complex, where they were provided humanitarian aid and supplies. Meanwhile, in the Rimal area of Gaza, the Air Force struck several compounds used to launch anti-tank missiles. In central Gaza, two terror cells were eliminated in two separate incidents, including one exiting a tunnel shaft. Fifteen Hamas terrorists were killed in total. And in southern Gaza, several terrorist infrastructure sites were dismantled, and about a dozen terrorists were eliminated by precise sniper fire. Following an assessment with officers, Defense Minister Gallant said senior Hamas operatives captured by troops in the Gaza Strip have told interrogators that the group is collapsing from within. Prime Minister Netanyahu is recovering from a successful hernia surgery at Hadassah Hospital in Jerusalem. Before entering surgery, the Prime Minister gave a press conference covering a range of war-related topics. More from ILTV's Devo Klein. Netanyahu, aged 74, was under full anesthesia during the operation, leaving Justice Minister Levine in charge of the country for several hours. Doctors and the Prime Minister's office said in a statement that the surgery had gone as planned and has been successful. Ahead of the surgery, the Prime Minister was reported feeling well and followed his planned schedule, which included a meeting with the families of female IDF soldiers held hostage in Gaza as well as the war cabinet meeting. He also spoke to the press about the war and his health. Turning to the war in Gaza, the Prime Minister reiterated once again that an IDF operation in Rafah is inevitable. Relating to the continuing cross-border warfare on the northern border that has forced tens of thousands from their homes, Netanyahu said the situation 
would soon change, either through diplomacy or a military operation. בלי למסור פרטים, אנחנו לא נשאיר את המצב כפי שהוא. יש לנו כ-60 אלף, יש שאומרים שזה 70, ויש כאלה שאומרים שזה פחות מזה. 70 אלף, 60 אלף איש שנעקרו מבתיהם. אנחנו מחויבים, אני מחויב להחזיר אותם. כדי להחזיר אותם זה לא רק לדאוג להם אזרחית, כפי שאמרתי עכשיו, זה גם לדאוג להם ביטחונית. קרי, אנחנו רוצים לייצר את תנאי הביטחון ואת תחושת הביטחון, שתאפשר להם לעשות זאת. אני אומר כל הזמן, אנחנו נדאג לעשות זאת. אני מעדיף שאם הדבר ניתן, שנעשה זאת באמצעים מדיניים, אבל אם לא, נעשה זאת באמצעים אחרים. לגבי לוחות זמנים ותוכניות פעולה, אני מעדיף לא לשתף את האויבים שלנו בזה. As the war in Gaza rages on and Israel faces an increase in terror threats, here to speak with us about the situation is Jerusalem News Syndicate Bureau Chief Alex Tryman. Alex, as always, it's a pleasure to have you here on ILTV. I wanted to start by asking you your thoughts on the continued delay on the Rafah operation. Now, we've heard from Prime Minister Netanyahu that he's committed to moving forward even after this uh, surgery that he just went under, yet it's been weeks and the operation still hasn't happened. Why the delay? Thanks, Emily. Well, first off, uh, Israel has a lot of work to do before it goes into Rafah. Uh, in the meanwhile, you see that Israel's been operating uh, heavily in and around Shifa Hospital and elsewhere in the Strip, uh, trying to make sure that the areas that they've gone through before uh, don't turn into uh, new terror havens if, is, if and when Israel does go into Rafah. But even uh, an operation inside Rafah needs a tremendous degree of preparation. Israel's going to undertake efforts to move uh, the tent cities that you're seeing there in Rafah. Uh, to areas that are north of the Rafah. And uh, to do that, they're going to make sure that there's tents and uh, other uh, infrastructure and access to humanitarian aid set up. So Israel has a lot of work to do before they're going to go into Rafah. It's probably a, a matter of uh, several weeks before that operation commences at this point. Now, it's interesting because all the things you're describing are actually efforts to protect civilian lives, whereas a lot of people are reporting the opposite, especially in the international media. Would that be accurate to say that a huge part of the reason that there has been a delay on Rafah is because Israel is trying to avoid civilian casualties? Prime Minister Netanyahu has been very clear about this. He said that it's the right thing to do to get the civilians out of harm's way. Uh, and Israel is actually going to be footing a significant portion of the bill to make sure yeah. that uh, this civilian infrastructure is there, including tents and others. So it's something that's that's not being uh, not being uh, very widely reported. The United States, on the other hand, has offered its alternative to a Rafah uh, operation, and it's really no operation at all. It's just to, to encircle the area and to do targeted raids uh, when there's direct intelligence and to set up a joint command between Israel and the U.S. where the U.S. would basically be able to veto any of those targeted operations. So, uh, you know, definitely a, a difference between what uh, the United States and Israel think and what the international community is reporting. But Israel definitely does want to try to keep the, the um, ratio between combatants and civilians killed uh, down to as low as possible. Now, the government right now is facing increasing pressure to make a deal to release hostages. We see protests popping up all over the country as well. Now, do you believe the government is doing enough on this front and what more can be done? Well, you see Netanyahu and Gallant, the defense minister, saying that the only way that you're going to get hostages released is if is if uh, there is strict military and diplomatic pressure on Hamas, and they're continuing to do that. The United States is really undercutting a lot of these negotiations, especially by allowing resolutions against Israel to pass at the United Nations. Uh, but what you're seeing with regard to the protests is something a little bit different. And uh, the you've had here five elections in five years. Uh, the same organizers of the anti-Netanyahu protests were the same organizers of the protests against judicial reforms that caused the big major protest movement in the summer. And those same organizers of the protests from the very beginning of the war with against Hamas jumped on board to be providing aid to hostage families. Now, of course, if you look at who was actually attacked on October 7th, a lot of these communities were kibbutzim that don't vote with the Israeli right, that did not vote for this current coalition. So they're 
political preferences before the war started was to replace Netanyahu. And what you're seeing now is this uh, alignment of these two groups, which is really what the uh, protest movement against Netanyahu wanted the entire time, to see these two uh, alignments uh, conflate. And, and, and it finally has happened, and that's why we're starting to see these protests against the government on the streets of Israel. Now, the last week has seen increased terrorist activity in the north, in the south, even a lot. How is Israel preparing militarily for these threats on multiple fronts? Do you believe that they're doing enough? Well, from day one, Israel understood that this can very well uh, quickly become a multi-front war. They've been prepared and, and operating uh, in the north, uh, in Lebanon, as Hezbollah has fired more than 2,000 uh, rockets, drones, anti-tank guided missiles at Israel, and Israel's killed over 200 people inside Lebanon uh, so far. So that's a very active front. We know that uh, Israel's been attacked by the Houthis. Uh, just today, there was attacks from uh, Iraq that uh, a drone hit a building in, in Eilat, uh, Israel has been very active in Syria, and of course we've seen uh, the a growing number of terror incidents uh, in Judea and Samaria, as well as other parts of Israel. So Israel has been operating uh, on a multi-front battle and, and has to keep its eyes open. I think that they're doing all that they can, but uh, especially when it comes to terrorism, it, it's very hard to prevent these uh, incidents before they occur. Absolutely. Well, we are out of time, but I want to thank you, as always, Alex, for your insight. Thanks so much, Emily. Experience the power of truth with ILTV News. If you're looking for quality content and captivating visuals, join our news community and become an integral part of our team as we embark on a mission to unveil the real Israel, dismantling the web of lies and misinformation that surround reporting on Israel. By subscribing to ILTV News, you will not only have access to the latest updates, but you will also amplify our message, creating a ripple effect that carries the truth far and wide. Subscribe today and help reshape the narrative. Available on the web, Android, and Apple. In other news, Israel has sent the UN a plan to take apart UNRWA. We'll talk to ILTV's Rachel Safdie to know more. Rachel, what can you tell us about this plan? Hi, Emily. Well, yes, last week we saw that Israel sent in a plan to UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres to dismantle UNRWA as a whole. Now, we know that UNRWA is supposed to be the UN Relief Agency for Palestinian Refugees, but in actuality, we saw uh, evidence exposed during this war that UNRWA members actually took part on the October 7th massacre, that 50% of UNRWA employees have direct family members that are either in Hamas or the Palestinian Islamic Jihad terror organizations. Uh, and we have saw that that 75% of UNRWA's funding was cut by many, many countries after uh, the agency's ties to terrorism uh, were exposed. Now, what this plan says, what Israel suggests, is that in the beginning, around 300 to 400 of UNRWA's employees would be moved to a different UN agency, such as the World Food Program, for example. And over time, UN assets, uh, facilities, uh, and employees would be moved around to whatever organization would replace UNRWA. Now, UNRWA's spokesperson says that due to UNRWA's size and, and how much they help with the distribution of aid now during the war, it would be a big mistake uh, to dissolve uh, or, or substitute the agency right now. And Israel says that that is part of the problem, that UNRWA uh, is the reason that a lot of the humanitarian aid isn't being distributed properly. So that's what we know about Israel's plan. Now, we've also seen that Israel contested a UN-backed report on the humanitarian situation in Gaza. Now, what do we know about this report, Rachel? Right. So on Friday, Israel contested this report that was backed by the UN that talks about how there is a humanitarian crisis in Gaza and how by now famine is imminent and will most probably happen by, by May. Now, COGAT, which is a body under the Defense Ministry of Israel responsible for uh, civilian affairs in the Palestinian territories, uh, actually said that there's some very, very... Uh, big flaws in this report, some of them very serious. For example, in the report it says that there's around one liter of water per person per day in Gaza, while Kogat said that according to, to their statistic and, and their evidence, there's 20 liters of water per person per day in the Gaza Strip. Kogat stressed that since the beginning of this war, there are no limitations to the amount of aid that they allow into the Gaza Strip. Um, they are able to inspect and, and approve around 44 trucks an hour in the Kerem Shalom crossing, and that every day since the beginning of this war, uh, around 150 to 200 trucks enter the Gaza Strip, most of them with food. 
Uh, now, that's a very big spike. It's around 80% more that used to enter the Gaza Strip before, prior to October 7th. And those trucks uh, weren't mostly food. They were mostly constructed, construction material, cement, and we all know what Hamas did with that. Uh, so that's what the report said, and that's why Israel contested it. Thank you, Rachel. As Israel continues the battle against Hamas and Gaza and Hezbollah on the northern front, the families of hostages are among the tens of thousands of Israelis taking to the streets to call for elections. Let's take a closer look. Tens of thousands of Israelis gathered outside the Israeli parliament yesterday for a four-day protest event, demanding the resignation of Netanyahu, new elections, and a hostage deal to bring the remaining hostages home. The protests were ultimately broken up when police fired foul-smelling skunk water at the protesters who had blocked highways and entrances to the city. Many protesters expressed shock that Prime Minister Netanyahu was still in power, despite the shocking failures in intelligence on October 7th. While Israelis largely support the war against Hamas in Gaza, the Israeli government has come under harsh but justified criticism following the most horrific attack Israel has ever seen. Protests have intensified as controversy continues over the failure of the ultra-Orthodox community to come to an agreement concerning the IDF draft, which many of their community had previously been exempted from, as well as the fact that the Knesset just went on recess in the middle of a war. The protesters are planning four days of rallies and activities throughout Israel in the coming days, including a tent city set up near Israeli parliament, and will feature major Israeli political leaders, past and present, as well as the families of some of the hostages who remain in Gaza. Since the October 7th war, the Houthis in Yemen have fired rockets repeatedly at Israel's southernmost city, Elat. But yesterday, we saw an escalation from across a different border that surprised many. ILTV's William Sharon has the latest. On Sunday, a hostile aircraft infiltrated into Israeli territory from Jordan and fell in the city of Elat. While the aircraft crashed into a building in Elat, there were no injuries reported. Since October 7th, the attacks on Elat have came from the Iranian-backed terror group, the Houthis in Yemen, whose activity has disrupted global shipping routes, prompting military responses from the UK and US in recent months. But yesterday's attack was not from the Houthis. It was from the Iranian terror groups backed by the Iranian regime inside Jordan. In recent days, Jordan has been under increasing pressure as tens of thousands of Palestinians have been rioting in the streets. Jordan has accused Hamas of inciting riots and violence within Jordan to increase instability in the Middle Eastern country, which has a long-standing peace agreement with Israel. While well, following the massive anti-Israel protests in both London and New York last week where attendees showed explicit support for terrorist organizations and blatant anti-Semitism, the UK's Metropolitan Police in London are facing increased scrutiny following a viral video of a young woman asking a policeman whether or not a swastika on a sign at an anti-Israel rally was illegal. His response shocked the internet. Let's take a closer look. Something's likely to cause a massive alarm and stress if it is written, or there's written words, or there's um, spoken words that are abusive. So, sorry, if we, under, what, under what context is a swastika not disrupting it's public order? Could you just explain under what symbol that's not disrupting public order? I haven't said at any point about it that it, it is or it isn't. Everything needs to be taken within context, doesn't it? Yeah, but it's a context of hate. But why, why, does a con why does this a want to be in context? Israel. Israel is this is my question. Is why, why is this want to be not immediately anti Semitism? Why does it need context? This is what I'm confused about. This isn't even about Israel. Hitler is, is not anti Semitic. Hitler 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 is not anti now here to speak with us about that incident is Jocelyn Weiss, the young woman in the video. Jocelyn, thank you for joining us today. Now the officer who you spoke to seemed to have trouble stating that a swastika was indeed anti-Semitic. What was your takeaway from this encounter? My takeaway was that I, I think the Met Police is a bit lost. Um, I, I want to say that they're confused. I think I'm giving them a bit too much courtesy when I say that. Um, what I do know is that they've made statements since that they arrested that guy and that they offered to accompany me immediately to take care of the situation. That 
was not what happened. Um, they were very dismissive. And they also have not contacted me since to let me know that they arrested the guy. I hope they did. Um, but their, their response, um, I was kind of shocked. I, you know, I really didn't, I just can't believe it happened. I can't believe he actually said those words. It shouldn't um, be something so controversial, yeah. right? After this video went, right. went viral, the Metropolitan Police, as you mentioned, did claim that they arrested the individual and even that they offered to help you. Um, first of all, is that accurate? You claimed at least part of it was not. And second, have you been surprised by the outrage on social media against the police's conduct? Thank you for asking. I, I was not surprised by the backlash at all. In the past uh, few months, uh, the Met Police has made multiple statements that chanting jihad is not anti-Semitic, um, that projecting from the river to the sea on Big Ben is not anti-Semitic. They've made many of these claims of blatantly anti-Semitic things that are not anti-Semitic and need to be taken in context. So I'm not surprised by the backlash in response to this, because the backlash in response to those things was also quite large. I was just shocked that it was a swastika. Um, I didn't think it would get that far. Um, I suppose I shouldn't be that surprised in retrospect. But no, the response does not surprise me at all. Now, we've um, seen... And, and I don't know if they went to the guy. <laughs> We've seen similar trends and in other countries of, of blatant anti-Semitism, even support for terrorism on the streets. Why do you think that police, whether in the UK or even in the United States, Canada, why are they so reluctant to crack down on this extremism that's so blatantly anti-Semitic? I think that, um, again, thank you for the question. I think that we are, what we need to remember is we are halfway through the 2020s, which is crazy. Um, but we started off this decade um, very chaotically um, with lockdown, and that was really quite strong policing, and that was curfews and all this sort of stuff. Then the summer of 2020 happened, and there was a huge backlash. Um, and there was a lot of, you know, defund the police, the police have too much power. And so what society has expected from the police as, as to how they are kept safe, that the definition of that is, con is constantly changing, right? Um, and so there is a lot of mixed messaging in that regard. Um, but in particular to this, I think that people right now, what they want is to know that if there are literal terrorists on the street, that the police will protect them. And, and I don't think that's the message that the police in London have sent today. Um, and I, what I want to tell people in England is that people are seeing this, right? This is what people think of London. And it's a shame because, you know, London is a really wonderful city. Um, and it's a city with a really great and beautiful and thriving Jewish community. And it's not... This is, it doesn't represent London as a whole, but this is the message that the world is seeing. Um, and it's important that people know that um, so that they can be aware of it. But yeah, I think the police, I think the message that they're sending in trying to minimize the issue is exactly the opposite of what they should be doing, which is taking responsibility. And again, at the very least, reaching out to me to say, hey, just so you know, we arrested the guy. Um, I'm not exactly hard to get in touch with. So. Now, it seems that, that many people in these protests are sort of conflating criticism of Israel with support for terrorism and, and hatred of Jewish people. What would you like to see from the authorities in many of these Western countries where these protests are taking place to, to deter this, to push back against this? Again, thank you so much for the question. I, I, what I would like to see, well, first of all, what I would like to say, if if they're going to maintain this line of criticizing the Israeli government, I would expect a basic knowledge of civics in regards to this issue. I think most of the people who say, I'm not being anti-Semitic, I'm criticizing the Israeli government, could not define the word Knesset if you asked. Um, I think <laughs> many of these people like probably don't even know that Palestine is two different places. Um, and so I think it's very ironic for them to say, oh, I'm criticizing the Israeli government when, again, there's a lack of knowledge of anything in regards to Israeli or Middle Eastern politics at absolutely, all. Absolutely, absolutely. Like Jocelyn, I'm, Jocelyn, I'm so yeah. sorry to cut you off, but we are out of time. No I want to thank you for your courage, also for showing up and for taking part and for taking this policeman to task. Please continue what you're doing and, and stay safe out there in London. Thank you. <laughs> Let's take a look at the weather forecast. Partly cloudy skies expected tonight around the country with temperatures reaching lows of around 19 degrees Celsius or 67 degrees Fahrenheit. Then tomorrow, partly cloudy conditions remain alongside hot temperatures set to reach highs around the country of 29 degrees Celsius or 84 degrees Fahrenheit. 
That's all for today's news. For more updates from Israel on all your devices, check out our ILTV channels, subscribe to our ILTV newsletter, and don't forget to check out our new and improved website, ILTV.tv, with all the latest news from the heart of the state of Israel. I'm Emily Schrader. Be well, and thank you so much for watching.